A father's Facebook video goes viral with almost 11 million views. See why so many are saying it's a light in the darkness on today's 700 Club Interactive. Good morning and welcome to the show. The great preacher Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. may have said it best. Hate begets hate. Violence begets violence. And over the weekend we saw the continuation of that vicious cycle as three police officers were murdered in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Here's what we know about the gunman. His name was Gavin Eugene Long and he planned the shootings as some kind of sick celebration on his 29th birthday. He was a former Marine turned lifestyle guru who posted racially tinged rants onto YouTube. In one of his last videos, he said that the act of protesting is useless and that revolution can only be attained through bloodshed. The three victims were Officer Matthew Gerald and Deputy Brad Garofola and Officer Montel Jackson. Gerald was a rookie cop who leaves behind a wife and two daughters. Garofola was a father of four he had just finished up his last shift before vacation. But he decided to stay a little longer just to help out before the shootings began on Sunday morning. Montrell Jackson was on the force for 10 years, and just a few months ago, he welcomed his baby son, Mason, into the world. Jackson had been working long hours over the last week in response to the recent protests, and a few days ago, he made a Facebook post that has since gone viral. Here are a few excerpts. Jackson said, these last three days have tested me to the core. I swear to God I love this city, but I wonder if this city loves me. These are trying times. Please don't let hate infect your heart. The city must and will get better. And then he concludes with this. If you see me and need a hug or want to say a prayer, I got you. Boy, that's poignant yeah. in the heels of all that happened. Well, Terry, obviously the country's in extreme anger and bitterness, there's so much hostility and sadness. And I, I think I've detected, as you probably have in the Christian community, there's, there's all those emotions too. And mm -hmm. it seems like some Christians I've spoken to are feeling hopeless. Yeah. Like this scenario, hostility in this nation, racial problems, is almost too big for God, yeah. right? And I think sometimes we feel like, because we need to figure out how to handle this, but we see God as a God of reconciliation, mm -hmm. right? Sent Jesus to reconcile our relationship with our heavenly Father, and That's in Second, message. Yeah. <laughs> and in Second Corinthians, the Apostle Paul reminds us this God of reconciliation has now called us yes. to be reconcilers as well, as if we're appealing for God ourselves. You know, probably in honor of all of these men who lost their lives in in the line of service to the city, we could best pay a tribute to them by honoring what Officer Jackson had to say. These are trying times, but don't let hate infect your heart. You know, you get a choice in that. Like, we don't have to be angry. We don't have to move to violence. And there are other things that need to change as well. And hopefully the loss of these precious lives is going to make us think about these things. Make us think about an officer who's afraid to do his job because of the color of his skin. That's ridiculous. And, and you read in John 17, you know, Jesus, shortly before his death, he prayed for himself, yes. prayed for his disciples, and then he prayed for believers, for you yes. and I, for all those that would follow. And what was his prayer for us? It was for unity. Yeah. It's like Jesus knew how difficult it would be for us in relationships and community, and he said, God, I pray they're unified. Mm -hmm. And unity is a choice, too. Here in the United States, we're still dealing with the aftermath of these recent shootings. If you're like me, you felt the need to respond in some way, maybe through social media or in conversations with family and friends, or maybe simply by praying. Well, Terry, one father in Oak Grove, Missouri, decided to make a video with his family and post it to Facebook. Alex Bryant had no idea it would make such an impact. In one week, it's had almost 11 million views. In the video, no one says a word. But the message is loud and clear. Take a look.
Our beautiful family. Well, joining us now by Skype is Alex Bryant, the executive pastor of New Life Church in Oak Grove, Missouri. Pastor Bryant, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So what gave you the idea for the video to do it that way? Um, you know, I, I just really felt like it was a, an inspiration from the Holy Spirit. Um, in lieu of the events that had happened a few days before, the young men that were killed, and, um, and then the police being shot. And um, um, I was processing that Thursday night and into Friday morning. I happened to take my son to a physical therapy appointment. And on the way back, I was listening to a song and it just it hit my heart. And I was just crying in my car on the way home. And I got home and just told my wife what was on my mind. And she said, you need to write this down. And I often don't journal and, and write. And this time it just kind of came to me in bullet points. And so my wife said, hey, go downstairs and write. I'll watch the kids. And in about 10 minutes, I came upstairs and showed her what I had. And she's like, you know, I told her exactly we wanted to make a video and we're not going to speak. We're going to use note cards. And she's like, I think the kids need to be a part of it. And it just it was just like it went from there, man. It was just we felt like both of us felt like the Holy Spirit just gave us what exactly what he wanted to do. I loved seeing your wife and each of your children appear in the video. You know, the, it's, the message that came to me as I was watching that was be the change you'd like to see. You know, it gives you an authority to speak from that perspective. What was it like for your family making the video with the kids and trying to explain to them the why and what's going on? Yeah, you know, that that's a message that we'd hoped come through. Um, our family is um, being a mixed race family. We've been in the middle of um, racial tension for a while. Um, I pastored in the inner city of St. Louis about five, mi five miles from Ferguson when that whole deal went down. And um, we had conversations many times, pointed conversations with our kids on what it means and um, you know, what it, how it affects us as a family, how it affects them. And, um, and our whole goal for that was for our kids to always um, see what's going on and be aware of it, but know that we can rise above that, that it doesn't have to be that way that God has created us um, to be the change that we want. And, um, and we've always tried to let our kids know that this isn't a black versus white thing. Um, this isn't a police versus the public thing. We have police officers in our family, but it's, it's sin. Sin has entered the world and it's um, a light versus darkness. And so we, when we explained it to our kids, what we wanted to do, we asked them if they wanted to be a part of it. And of course they did. And um, it was it was neat. We just prayed over it and and just hope that God would take it and use it the way that he wanted to. So. so, Alex, what does the church do? What do Christ followers actually do a step or two in order to help solve, if you will, the race relation problem in this country? I think, you know, the church overall has to be the face of love, um, the face of you know forgiveness and reconciliation. We have to do our best to be unifiers. And that takes an intentional effort. And um, I'm so blessed to be at a, at a church now where our pastor, um, Pastor Blancet, Todd Blancet, he, he he takes intentional steps to do that. You know, um, as far as even the staff that we've hired here, um, he's he's taken it the opportunity to hire intentionally so that we can be the face and look like and act like and talk like what we want to do. And um, and then we love. Um, there's so many opportunities here at our church. You know, we um, have taken to adopting and foster fostering kids that just need a home. And so um, even out here in Oak Grove, Missouri, I'd only been here a year or so ago. And, you know, it's not a lot of black people, not a lot of other, but they're intentionally loving people and, and letting all races know that they're welcome. And I think when a church feels like they have a mandate to do that, what God called us to do, to love um, everyone, the orphans, the widows, um, people of all races, you know, then other people will start to see that. And, and our efforts will start to take notice. And, and I think that's what we have to do. We just have to be the change that, um, that we're hoping for. We have to take it upon ourselves to act in a way that we think Jesus would. Love is an action word. You've been Absolutely. sharing this quote from your video on social media with the hashtag, let's start again. So if we haven't been actively pursuing this, where do we start, Pastor? I think it's just that we, we have to start um, you know, first of all, in prayer, just asking the Lord, what can I do and, and um, how can I be used? But we have to be um, willing to, to let love speak through our actions, not just our words. I think, you know, you, you guys had shared earlier the passage in John chapter 17. And I love that passage because um, Jesus starts his prayer with, Father, the time has come for you to glorify me so that I can glorify you. And, and I think that God's going to give us all an opportunity 
um, to be glorified so that we can then point um, to him. And it's all about bringing glory to him. Um, for us and our family, we, we had no idea that this video would go viral like it did and be seen by so many millions of people. But um, it's being faithful in the little things, letting our, our light shine where we're given the opportunity in our local areas, our local community, whether it's Facebook, whether it's at our church, at our schools. You know, so we just have to start doing what we can and then praying, God, the time has come. And if you want to glorify me, then I'll, I'll give the glory back to you. Well, Pastor, we thank you so much for joining us and for making the video. It has certainly touched many people during a time when we really need hope. Thanks so much for joining us today. Mm -hmm. Thank you for having me. God bless you. God bless you. Terry? You know, I think of that place in Scripture where God says to Moses before a big moment, what do you have in your hand? And that's what he's saying is you don't need like a lot of direction. It's like, what is God putting right in front of you? Ask him to show you and then do it. <laughs> and rely on him yes. to get it done. Yes, yes. Well, up next, the child of two alcoholics battles her own demons. I just felt worthless, just feeling like my value was like the dirt. I tried to um, kill myself. I took almost an entire bottle of Tylenol. Watch how this young woman finds a reason to live after this. Lauren Dunn grew up in a household with two alcoholics. From an early age, she felt worthless, and her feelings only escalated in adulthood. Her depression almost destroyed her, and then someone gave her a reason to live. There were times when I did feel, as a little girl, that I had a lot of burdens to carry. I remember feeling that I wanted to be somebody else, and I remember feeling not okay about who I was. Lauren Dunn was three years old when her parents, who were both alcoholics, divorced. For much of her childhood, she was fearful of her mother's frequent mood swings. Who spilled this on the carpet? Sorry, You're gonna no. get it! I didn't know if she would get angry. I didn't know if she would get sad. I didn't know if she would be happy. And her overreaction would be getting very angry about a small situation and I was left feeling like I did something wrong. I would begin to just feel wrong about who I was and wrong in my spirit. She had a close bond with her grandmother, but when Lauren was just 10 years old, her grandmother died. The acceptance Lauren once knew was replaced with feelings of loneliness and depression. I didn't want to open myself up to experiencing that level of sadness. And having lost my grandmother, who we lived with when I was younger and had played a major role in my life, I didn't know how to handle that. Lauren learned to stifle her feelings and tried to find a sense of self-worth through overachieving. As a teenager, I really wanted to fit in. I really wanted to belong. I wanted to be accepted. And I felt so worthless and I felt so sad. And so I would study really hard. I would excel in sports and I thought that my value was based on things that I did. Lauren's parents went into recovery and got clean, but Lauren still struggled with depression. Trying to find purpose and meaning, she got into relationships with boys, especially ones with their own problems. When I was in a relationship with somebody, I really wanted to fix them. If there was some kind of substance abuse issue, which was often the case, I wanted that approval. In her senior year, a bad breakup sent her deeper into depression. I remember feeling like this emptiness, that something is missing, and wanting to fill this hole and this void. I just felt worthless, just feeling like my value was like the dirt. And I, I tried to um, kill myself. I took almost an entire bottle of Tylenol. Lauren was rushed to the emergency room where she recovered Having survived, Lauren decided to become a counselor to help others who faced similar struggles. After college, she worked helping people with coping and life skills. She loved seeing people come around, but still hadn't faced her own demons. Some of the dark days for me, or what depression would look like, would be if I was sitting outside and the sun is shining and I'm sitting under a porch and the porch is blocking the sunlight. I know it's there, but I can't see it and I can't feel it. It just feels dark. 
At work, Lauren tried to hide her depression, but a coworker, Brian, a Christian, could tell something was wrong and reached out to her. He spoke of Jesus' love, and I, I never felt anything that was um, condemning or shaming and what he spoke, I just heard hope. And that's what I needed. Brian started telling her of the hope she could have in Jesus. One day while traveling together on business, Brian asked her to trust God with her struggles. He asked if I wanted to um, commit my life to Christ. And there was just this, um, this brokenness in me. And I, I so wanted it to be filled. I felt, um, I just, I knew that I needed something more, and I knew that that was the answer. So we pull over at this uh, place in this parking lot, and there's this sign that says the right track, and he prays for me, and I pray, and I, I ask Jesus to come into my life and into my heart. And from that moment, everything was different. Lauren says through prayer and reading the Bible, she finally realized her worth. Today, I see myself as um, a child of God. I see myself as chosen. I see myself as redeemed. I see myself as forgiven. Um, I see myself as pure. I see myself the way that God sees me. Lauren says her recovery was a process. Christian counseling, along with medication and support from her loved ones, helped in her battle with depression. But she couldn't have overcome it without God. What really changed for me was accepting Christ as my Savior. It, there's nothing that can supplement for that. Today, Lauren calls the coworker who led her to Christ her husband. And she and Brian are expecting their first child. Lauren finished graduate school and is now completing her internship on her way to becoming a fully licensed professional counselor. She has a good relationship with both parents and her mother is a Christian. Life with God is a, a peace that I can't explain. And that doesn't mean that I don't have days where I might still feel sad because I have. And the difference today is I know who I am in Christ. I know where I'm going and I know whose child I am and nothing can take that away from me. So I don't have to stand alone anymore. I don't feel alone because I'm not alone. And you don't have to stand alone either. From the very beginning, God had a plan and a purpose for this world and for each of us. He had it for you. If you have days where you feel some of the same things that Lauren said she felt, then consider the claims of Christ because he said, I came that you might have life and have it abundantly, fully, worth everything that I intended. The Bible says we're fearfully and wonderfully made in the image and likeness of our God. You know, the enemy of God is a liar. He's called the father of lies. And sometimes in our most vulnerable moment, we believe some of the things he tells us about ourselves. We always are chosen. We always are loved by the Father. We have been redeemed by Jesus. That's why he came to cover all of our needs so that we could be free. We have to come to the end of listening to the lies and say, Jesus, come into my heart and life, not because I've done anything, but because you are the Savior and I need you. If you'd like someone to pray with in your own life, call the number on our screen. It's 1-888-777-1999. Andrew? Amen. Great reminder, <laughs> Terry. Well, still ahead, he has seen multiple miracles in his church. When we come back, Pastor Brent Anderson tells us why daily miracles are possible. Stay with us. Pastor Brent Anderson witnessed multiple miracles in his church in Ashgrove, Missouri, miracles we have told you about on this program. So we asked him, is it possible to see miracles every day? And here's what he had to say about it. Many have asked me, the miracles that we're seeing in your church, the healings, am I able to see that in my daily life? Am I able to see that in my family, in my homes, in my church too? And my answer is yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> you are able to see that. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 54, verse 17, that no weapon 
formed against you shall prosper and that every tongue that rises up against you, you shall condemn. It says that this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. This is the inheritance of his sons and his daughters and that their righteousness is in me, says the Lord. Our inheritance is that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. That word prosper means to accomplish the purposes wherewith it was originally called. That means cancer can't accomplish its purposes. Diabetes can't accomplish its purposes. A migraine headache, a broken bone, a financial hardship, marital strife. When the disciples asked Jesus, they said, Lord, how do we pray? Jesus said, you have, here, pray this way. He said, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed or holy Lord is your name. You begin with praise and you begin with worship. You see, you enter his gates with thanksgiving and you enter his courts with praise. Praise is always the first thing. It's, it's the entrance way into his presence. And where the presence of God is, the power of God is. Then Jesus goes on to say, Lord, let your kingdom come and let your will be done. And it's just a natural progression. Worship and praise brings the kingdom. And then the kingdom brings the power. It's our purpose as sons and daughters. It's our purpose every day to bring heaven to earth, to bring the culture of heaven to earth. You see, in heaven, there's no tears. In heaven, there's no sorrow. In heaven, there's no sickness and there's no pain and there's no agony. So to answer your question, can I have this in my church? Can I have this in my home? Can I have this in my workplace? Can I, can I experience healing every single day flowing through me onto somebody else? And can I see the manifest presence and power of God demonstrated through my life? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Because it's your inheritance. That's the power you have because of the work of the cross. That's the power you have through the mighty name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus. You are His and the devil can't take you away. Thank you, Brent, so much. Terry, I was watching that thinking of what you said earlier about we're so often to believe the lies of the enemy. Sometimes even Christ followers forget the promises of God. Yeah. The other day I was having a particularly rough time, just struggling with something, and I said, Lord, I want to spend time with you. I don't know where to start today. Yeah. And I just felt in my spirit, the Holy Spirit saying to me, yeah. just praise me. Yeah, it, that's what I thought as this pastor was speaking. Sometimes I come with my need, I come with my ask, and I don't do that lead in, which builds our faith in who he is. And sometimes yes. I don't really want to hear my problems. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to recite them. I know what they are, I don't want to hear them. Yeah, and, and I don't know if right. Christ isn't looking for the list. Yeah, but, exactly. And the praise is as much for us as him. <laughs> it's you know? totally for us, really. He knows we need to build up in our hearts who he is so we can stand with authority on our inheritance position. And he loves Amen. us so much. We hope this program has reminded you of Christ's love for us. We leave you with these words from Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we've tackled some tough topics today and we urge you and request you to be praying for this nation with all we're struggling with, that God's love will pour forth to a hurting world. We'll see you next time on 700 Club Interactive. Bye-bye.